if you're a traveling fisherman, you know, and you have the wherewithal to camp and eat fish and live on the beach. Yeah. And, you know, if you have that idea in your mind, like Baja is Mecca for that. I yeah. mean, it's, it was just such a crapshoot. You know, we had a little boat with an old two stroke engine on it. We had and a we, placemat. We didn't even have a, a GPS. Yeah, we had a place. We had a placemat map. map that the owner of the hotel had showed us the night before. Uh, the idea of a feeding frenzy of bellfish is a, in any fisherman's mind, is a, is a pretty crazy concept. Just to see one, right? Yeah. Just to see one. Once we hooked a handful of them, casting at them with spin gear, and it was like, you know, obviously, we, our minds were like, the idea was to try to get one on the fly, and we just blew up all the gear we had. Like. <laughs> A couple that first day, I remember I hooked one on a Yozuri bull popper. Yep. And thing goes nuts, eats the popper, greyhounds off in the distance, full marlin deal. We were we were beside ourselves, and it starts getting closer to the boat. And I'm like looking at Rudy like, you know, I've, you've done this before, right? And he's looking at me like, <laughs> you've done this before. I was like, Neither of us had buddies build a marlin. <laughs> I caught a couple of them, but never, never built build one. one. Yeah. yeah, it's a nat. Ge- Every That's time a- you go out there, it's like you're turning down the nat geo channel. You never know what you're gonna see, but normally it's, it's gonna, gonna be, be at awesome. least some but the- one thing that will blow your mind. All right, guys, welcome to the Skiff Warner podcast. Today, I am joined by George and Rudy from Los Locos Mag Bay. You guys can say your own last names because I'm not even going to try. <laughs> I'm George Vandercook. Rudy Babakin. All right, so where did you guys grow up and how would you start fishing? I grew up in New York. We lived in Long Island for a little and then moved to New York City. Um Grew up fishing on Long Island and in upstate New York on the Beaverkill River. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was in the Northeast as well, up in Maine, and uh, very fortunate to have a river behind my house that was quick, easy access. And my dad was a big fisherman, so he always forced me to get out on the water as much as possible, which was awesome. Did you guys grow up fly fishing? I Yeah, we both did. We, yeah. Yeah, for the most part. We used spin rods a good bit too, but fly rods were always the priority when we were given the opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, like, when do you guys start guiding? I guided a little bit in Jackson, not very much, um, when I moved out there after college. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we kind of just jumped right into the Los Locos thing. Yeah, I did a Decent bit in uh, throughout college, and then up in Rhode Island, and then uh, a little bit in Wyoming as well. Then bounced around from Bolivia, uh, Argentina, guided down there a little bit too. Excuse me, um, but yeah, I was fortunate to travel around a little bit before the Los Locos things that got us a little bit better idea of how to run that operation down there. Yeah, no, yeah. we've both been you know fortunate enough to be able to travel some cool places and host trips and guide some cool places and. See some different operations, you know, before like really sinking our teeth into the Los Locos thing. But um, it was, it's definitely been a, a trial and error, yeah, trial by yeah. fire, if you will, um, situation. How did, how did you, how did you two like meet each other? And then, t- like, what's the story between like meeting each other and then all the way into Los Locos? I mean, we, I feel like when I first moved to Jackson Hole after college, for like the first two years I was there, I was always hearing about this guy that I needed to meet, like Rudy, who was like there, like in our friend circle, like I was like fishing dude, Rudy was fishing dude, and all of our other buddies were like skiers and mountain bikers. Yeah. And yeah, uh, yeah and then we started fishing together and hanging out, and it turned into, you know, a situation where we were on the same page of wanting to leave the restaurant we were both working at at freaking midnight and go fish all night and come back at <laughs> seven o'clock in the morning and man, similar minds find each other. When same pitch, yeah. And uh, yeah, fortunate to link up with George and be able to do some cool trips here and there. And yeah, got some got some good fish. And after that, we George went down to Baja, did the loop with more of a. I think it was more of a surfer mentality than a fishing mentality. Yeah, we. I mean. So I had a, a boat back on the East Coast. Um, my aunt used to work at a Boston Whaler dealership, and I had a 19-foot, uh, I think it was a Nantucket, right? Montauk. No, it's a Nantucket. Yeah. They only made one year of oh, a Nantucket. Yeah. Um, 
19 foot Nantucket Boston Whaler and we I trailered it out to Jackson one summer and like it, it's a seasonal town so we, we worked in restaurants we guided fishing coach skiing things like that and then you know from basically from October until almost Christmas the town is like completely dead the restaurants close people go travel and then everything fills back in like just before Christmas so the fall plan was to trailer the boat from Jackson down the Baja Peninsula and surf and fish and spearfish and have a good time. And we did that um, the first year. And the second year, I kind of got Rudy on board, and I was like, man, let's let's go let's go find this blitzing striped marlin thing. And, yeah. and we, we, honestly, it was more of a find a marlin. Like, yeah, the expectations right, exactly. were low. Um, but they were immediately exceeded after the first really hour of being out on the ocean in, in the area. Um, we hooked up to Wahoo. We hooked up to Marlin, uh, all in spinning rods, but it was still, it was, I remember First getting back insane, yeah. that day and calling my old man and saying, we found something that was special. Yeah. And I, we both thought it was a fluke, and we had a couple other buddies with us as well, and all of our minds were just blown. So it took a few days for us to realize that wasn't just one day of the year that that happens, and it's a consistent fishery. And yeah, after that, we realized we could find a cool little niche market where we could fly fish for these as opposed to the traditional ways of throwing bait at them or trolling through them. And uh, yeah, it ended up being very uh, successful. And it, it, in my opinion, it's a lot more fun when you're feeding these fish something that's artificial and it's all in a stop boat and yeah with a fly rod you can't beat that so when you guys went down there you'd already heard about we had heard about it in like when i got rudy on board for this trip like it was like okay rudy's coming like we're gonna get serious like yeah you know the all the research and stuff that we did you know rudy kind of spearheaded it and we started seeing you know these reports from all these different sport fishing boats we raised 70 plus fish we hooked 80 of them we've like these crazy reports and there was a Jeff Courier report wasn't yeah. there and he and didn't do great but they didn't do great but the, the the numbers were insane you know just the amount a sheer amount of marlin yeah. they were seeing we were like yeah that sounds like we're gonna have a pretty good shot at least <laughs> at least seeing them like we have a month there yeah, yeah we have a boat it is 19 feet long but you know it was like so one of those things we had some time and you know we the year before we had such a good time on the Baja and I really fell in love with it and it is a unique, amazing place. And especially if you're a traveling fisherman, you know, and you have the wherewithal to camp and eat fish and live on the beach. Yeah. And, you know, if you have that idea in your mind, like Baja is Mecca for that. I yeah. mean, it's, it's a, it's a community in, in a place where all the different communities around the peninsula, like, support and celebrate that lifestyle and you you run into people who have been lost down there for years you know and they that's it and i think when rudy came down you know when our other buddies and it it, it just clicked that that was yeah that was a cool lifestyle and the marlin thing was um just this astounding spectacle yeah the first day we got out there yeah. it was it in the crazy thing about it is we, we, we had an idea of, like, you know, what we wanted to see and mm-hmm. what, like, what the possibilities were. Like, the idea of a feeding frenzy of billfish, you know, is uh, the idea of a feeding frenzy of billfish is a, in any fisherman's mind, is a, is a pretty crazy concept. Just to see one. Right. Yeah. Just to see one. You know, yeah. We've, yeah. we've both offshore fished before and, you know, you spend a lot of time needle in a haystack for, for these yeah. things yeah and yeah. and um and you know we both grew up fishing on the northeast where you fish for these blitzing pods of bluefish striped bass false albacore it's something that's very familiar to us and the idea of like something similar to that but with substitute pounds. billfish yeah. for for false albacore i yeah. mean it's it's uh and it is exactly that. Yeah. I mean, and when they're that big, you can wa- you can tra- track the fish. So it's not like an albie you see for a quick second. It's like, okay, there's the blue stripes. Okay, now it's over there. And it's, it's just watching them swim around the boat, yeah, waiting and, for them to get close. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah. that, but like, you know, there, that first day in Mag Bay was like, I, uh, it was just such a crapshoot. You know, we had, 
a little boat with an old two-stroke engine on it. With a we, placemat. We didn't even have a, a GPS. Yeah, we had a placemat. We had a placemat map. map that the owner of the hotel had showed us the night before, who was not a fisherman, mind you. We pulled into this hotel at about 7.30, and he was so excited. He had just built the hotel. It was completely empty. There was nobody there. He was like, you guys just want to stay in a room, or you can just camp on the beach for like five bucks a night, use all the facilities of the hotel. And we were like... Well, that sounds great. Five yeah. bucks a night. We'll do the five <laughs> bucks. Literally five bucks a day. We'll do the five bucks a night. And then we ended up not paying them because we ended up trading fish for our yeah. rent. So we ended up every day we'd come back, we'd have a couple of Wahoo or Dorado. It's like, here's your, here's our rent pretty we, much. We, yeah, we, we've traded fish for everything that year, basically. Except Other than gasoline. Gas. Yeah. We couldn't figure out how to trade <laughs> fish for gas. <laughs> next, but, year, uh, next year, 2024. But literally... Uh, his name's Fito Gonzalez. He's turned into a great friend of ours and obviously like an integral part of how we run our business. Yeah. Um, and and he pointed out on a place map, he's like, this is the Thetis Bank. This is where people go sport fishing, I think. Yeah. I think. I think. And we're like, he's like, yeah, people catch tons of marlin all the time. They're freaking everywhere. And we're like, well, that sounds like good. And he's like, yeah, it's right here. You just go across the bay to here. You call a guy on Channel 16 named Raul. He'll pick you up on a truck with your boat, put it on a trailer, drive you over the land spit to the other side. And then from there, it's, you know, 28 miles out to the Thetis Bank, like just right out there. <laughs> oh, we it's, got that. And we're like, oh, okay. Perfect. <laughs> we set like some half-assed compass heading on this laminated placemat map. And... Uh, and went for it the next day. Called Raul, Channel 16, picked us up, jumped us over the land on some sketchy trailer with a truck that barely worked. And and we basically started putting out in the 19-foot whaler towards the heading that we had set. And we saw we saw a sport fisher, yeah, right? We, like after like an hour and a half, we were like, oh, man, we're not going to find this. And, and it was also flat calm that first day. It was yeah. like glass. Yeah. yeah. And then all of a sudden. But swells. Yeah. Off yeah. in the horizon, you could just see a little dot. And I was like, okay, that's got to be something. That could be it. So we just started going and sure enough, more and more boats. And we're not a ton, but like, like you see four three, boats. Four boats. Yeah. 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 You know, something's going on. And yeah. then we just like saw birds and. Free jumping we, marlin. And... Free jumping marlin. And we were like, oh my God. And we set up a trolling spread, which like something we didn't have like a ton of experience with at the time either <laughs> not but we, 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 we were pretending like we knew what we were doing yeah. and we hooked a wahoo immediately lost it at the boat we were like oh my god this is so cool and then we started seeing blitzing striped marlin thunderbirds on bait yeah. and and that was it i mean we hooked a couple that first day i remember i hooked one on a yozuri bull popper yep. and thing goes nuts eats the popper Greyhounds off in the distance, full marlin deal. We were we were beside ourselves, and it starts getting closer to the boat. And I'm like looking at Rudy, like you know how you've done this before, right? And he's looking at me like, <laughs> you've done this before. I was like neither of us have killed a marlin. I could crack. caught a couple of them, but never, never built, built one. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. So it was a. Uh, yeah, I remember seeing those, I think they're like 5-0 treble hooks, massive treble hooks on that bowl, and uh, trying to grab that pill, and it was like, oh, God. No. Yeah. And I remember I just like kind of looked at George, and like, things shook the hook, and I was like, thank God. That <laughs> but yeah, after that, the next day, I think we ended up landing a couple of them, yeah. and then we slowly started figuring it out. And most of that was on trolling or spinning lures still. And then the, finally, the last day, we were able to, Put the pieces because we after we got a couple marlin, I was like, okay, let's try to start getting them on the fly, and it started to click. And it was funny we, because like once we hooked a handful of them, casting at them with spin gear, and it was like you know, obviously we, our minds were like the idea was to try to get one on the fly, and we just blew up all the gear we had, like <laughs> broke rods, reels, everything, everything was breaking. We had one line. We had a rod that was zip tied. And I still have that rod together. in my room. Yeah, it's old Orvis <laughs> yeah. twelve weight. Yeah, zip, like fully held together by zip tie and duct. T the the reel seat was complete. Had completely snapped off, and we had it zipped. We had the reel like zip tied and duct taped to the rod. And Rudy landed this fish on the very last day that we were there. Last hour. I mean, it was yeah, yeah, full on fourth quarter overtime win there for on a thirty day trip. We yeah. got lucky on that one, but it was pretty cool. What was what was that that first striped marlin on fly? Do you remember like what like oh, what I was that experience? So like? I remember. So yeah, I remember. It. I remember it was yeah. yesterday, like the clothes we were wearing. The, yeah. Rudy had these gas station sunglasses on that we had bought in Pinedale, Wyoming that summer. Like, yep, Those it was. Cool. We were freaking. I mean. 
it was it was epic. I was driving the boat. Rudy put the shot on. It was pretty windy. Uh, yeah, the big thing that came down, uh, the, the biggest thing I remember was thinking, like, this is our last fly line. This is a terrible old cracking fly line. And I was thinking, like, okay, like, when's this going to break? When's this going to break? And then we were f kind of babying that fish. That fish, normally now we get them in, like, 20, 30 minutes, I'd say, landing time. Sometimes we get them in under, under five. But that fish took about 45 minutes because it was, like, okay, soft, soft, soft. But it was... And we also didn't, like, we didn't understand how to fight i mean we, for, we we had we had, i mean rudy obviously knows how to fight a big fish but it's like now we've come so far in our yeah. how we move the boat and the specific the yeah. specificities of the lines themselves and how important that is in yeah. fighting the fish and the boat handling is honestly one of the yeah. biggest things it's equally if not more important as the angler on in front of the boat yeah um just a lot of boat, yeah, lot of boat work yeah. fish, when you yeah. got a fish that big you're never going to pull a 200 pound fish up out of 100 feet of water ever if that thing wants to sink it's going to sink so you maneuver the boat to get the thing higher up and then but yeah that's the, that's the game where and i really enjoy about mag bay now is every day we're constantly experimenting yeah. and we're learning things like every every group that we have i i can almost every single group tell you like okay this group we learn this like this coloration this this hook this and the, all of our clients have different skill sets so it's really cool to have all these different communities of fishermen from like down here where we're at Baracho. yeah and we got these people from texas that bring some of their skills over we got people from florida the keys that 100%. bring their skills so like the northeast and it's been really cool working with all these good anglers that have we've been fortunate to fish with put all these little pieces of the equation together through each one of them and building a pretty successful uh, or good success rate for these marlin. Yeah. Which has been a real, honestly, the puzzle for me is the fun. Yeah. And oh, yeah. figuring out the puzzle. And that's what we're constantly doing. And that's why I, I don't know if it's ever going to get old. Yeah. It's and, 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 you know, the coolest thing about that puzzle that Rudy was talking about as well is, like, with where we always say, like, where we're at with the business, we're still in, like, an experimental exploratory stage yeah and i don't think that's ever going to change like the nature of mag bay and the dynamism of the fishery and how unique and special and multifaceted that fishery itself is you're never going to be able to figure out and, and nobody else is down there doing it so it's like there's nobody to ask there's nobody to get <laughs> intel from it's it's all on us and our captains and our guests that are coming down so like for the right people obviously it's not for everybody. The way I like to describe it is it's not for everybody, but if it's for you, it's really for you. Yeah. It's like, it's the coolest thing ever being, I mean, as an angler, as an explorer, as somebody who likes to be outside and appreciates natural spaces and natural resources. Like I think the most fun part for us is we're in this constant state of building. What are they doing? Where are they going? <laughs> what, what, what's going on with this fish? What's going on with that fish? tides moon phases everything how they move around the bay the bay is massive i mean it's the one of the largest i think it's the second largest surface area of mangroves in all of central america exists in magdalena bay which is something that people don't even have any idea about and it's a massive bay like way bigger than san francisco bay i mean you know the inshore the offshore thing and and like i was saying that's I think what is really cool about our operation and what we do down there and what we're able to share with people is that inherent exploratory nature yeah. of you're coming down to have an awesome trip, but you're also like, you're a guinea pig. You know I mean, like, <laughs> you're helping figure us. We, we like, like Rudy said, we get people from all over the world and some really incredible anglers, obviously all, all amazing people, but like, you know, people with a real skill set and experience level in these different little niches. In yeah, the fly and, they, and they world. got all of the, and they're just bringing in like one little piece of information yeah. that just like, oh, right. well, yeah. we can actually use that. Yeah, but I mean, it, like this last year, I watched. But for this, this is just one of several several examples. But one that was huge for me was watching John Snipes. I'm sorry, I don't know if you don't mind if I throw names no, out no. there. He's an awesome, awesome guy, one of my favorites. And watching him, saw him have a marlin eat right next to the boat, but the thing was coming towards him, and he just sat there. And knowing if he pulled, that fly was going to come straight out of his mouth. So he just sat there and held it for like I'd say like three, four seconds, waited for the fish to go the opposite way. 
and then it clicked like, oh, these aren't like a like a tarpon or a redfish or whatever else other species that can suck things in and spit it out. Like they, if it's in their mouth, the only way it's coming out is if you pull on it. So it was like a, you learn little things like that along the way, and um, yeah, that, the fishery down there is truly remarkable, and that's just the offshore what we've touched on so far. Yeah, it's a whole another world. Before we touch on the inshore. Damn. What is because I because I want people to understand like you guys aren't you guys now the operation isn't you're sleeping on a beach like what's the operation right. like, if somebody no, flies no, in no, like yeah, what yeah. should they expect no I mean it's it's funny that you mentioned that because yeah. you know now we are partnered with Fito who owns Mari Arena which is an eco hotel in Puerto San Carlos mm-hmm. um, and Fito got Vito worked in the government for years um i mean he's done everything from a commercial crab fisherman to yeah you know building houses is that a cinder blocks to anything to, i mean the guy's done anything. a lot he's really hard working like he's a serious guy he's a serious businessman and he um he worked in the government i think he was like a he was like a basically the equivalent of like a senator yeah yeah um for years and then he got this Ecotourism grant, yeah, which they they give people like governmental grants that they don't have to pay back to to do things that will tourism, you know, enhance tourism in 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 Baja because that's like the primary you know uh, source of income now. Yeah, yeah. Is, is 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 tourism. So so Fito got this you know amazing grant, built this place, um, and it's right on the beach on mag bay in um it's it's actually really nice it's super nice uh for you know in respect to the rest of the town and you know all about i mean it's it's yeah. a sweet spot and that's where we put people up in these villas right on the beach at mari arena and i have food at a couple of different restaurants and our the big thing that we like to stress for people is when you come fish with us it's not going to be your standard lodge that you go to where it's a very set schedule yeah where it's like okay tomorrow at 7 30 we'll pick you up we'll be fishing until 3 30 and then we go back we'll have dinner at four yada 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 it's not yeah. like that it's every day we're constantly changing the schedule to what the people want to do what what we can provide for them and yeah, what we think is the best option. So a lot of days we'll wake up at, like, say, 5 a.m., drive out to the grounds before it's even light out, like we were doing with the Costa crew, and, like, fish for, yeah, a few hours and then come back because we know the fishing's going to be a little bit slower in the afternoon. So we are we're always, it's not your standard operation, um, but with that being said, it's comfortable. We have great food. We have um, incredible the food is something we're talking about because we have an incredible amount of uh, everything from shrimp that are two feet long to lobsters to uh, abalone. It's an incredible amount of food. and The seafood is... I, I've worked in the restaurant industry my whole life and I'll, always been a cook or a chef. And, um, and you know, the, the access to seafood down there is... Unreal. Unreal. I mean, it's the coolest and it's stuff that, like, you're... That everybody's familiar with seafood wise, like don't you think, Rude? It's yeah. like you yeah. know your clams, your scallops, your yeah. shrimp, your lobsters, but it's like a little different, you know. It's yeah. like we have these beautiful chocolate clams that are kind of like an East Coast quahog or cherry stone, but they're not. They're like Mexican they've got a ball. Yeah, that's yeah. 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 like you know Where they, they have this cool there, red right? meat, and they, I'm in in it. Everything's just so fresh, and you get it so good, so cheap, and it's so abundant, and you know, like, and that's what like is it's it's you know it's what that town lives on right it's everybody's a commercial fisherman everybody has a panga like the panga per capita in that town has got to be it's two to one it's two to one (laughs) yeah yeah. and it's like you know you see 12 year old kids driving their dads to the boat ramp and dunking them in the water like picking them up at the end of the day and it's just, it's like what coastal communities in America must have been like, like 300 years ago. Yeah. And, and the resource itself speaks to that as well. And, and the ideas around like conservation and resource management are like, they exist and the, the, like, because people know, like the idea of leaving enough for your kids or for the next people, yeah. like in order to be able to make a living. So 
That's really cool. It's really cool. And we work with all local captains down there. And that's, I think, a really cool piece of what we do is our captains can interact with our guests from all these different walks of life, all these different crazy places of the world. You know, our captain who might have never even left San Carlos. Yeah. Or like that area. Yeah, Yeah. that area at all in his whole life, you know, can talk to people who speak English, speak French, speak Spanish, and have these crazy different life experiences. And then they come down to San Carlos. They appreciate the place. They appreciate the resources. And the captains are really proud of that. Yeah. Yeah. And they're really proud of the fish. And they're really proud of the locally specific knowledge that they have that's allowing us access to this amazing resource. And, you know, all those boundaries mm-hmm. are transcended by like, we're going out together <laughs> and we're trying to touch some fish. It's amazing what yeah. fishing does. It is. It like it brings sounds everyone cliche, together. but it's like, yeah. no matter how much money so-and-so our client makes, yeah. slash our captain. We're all in the battle now. Yeah. No, and, and, yeah. and, and everybody is appreciated. like. You know, our client Phil and our Captain Jose, like they're gonna they're gonna hang out and jive over the fact that we're <laughs> we're trying to catch fish. Right. And like this dude's fishy, that dude's fishy, doesn't matter where you're from, doesn't matter what you do for work. And um and it's just cool like seeing people vibe out like that and, and seeing how much pride ever everybody in San Carlos has in San Carlos and in, yeah. in, in Mag Bay and the resource and, and, and how they, and they know how special and unique it is. Yeah. 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 What, um, so, I mean, we, you know, we talked about the commercial and we talked about stripe, uh, the Marlin talk about the inch. Like, what are you guys doing inshore? The inshore? I mean, <clears throat> it's a, like George mentioned earlier, it's a huge, huge bay and yeah. the diversity and it's incredible all the way from the mangrove systems he was speaking of, which seem endless to uh, huge beaches that are, hundreds of miles long to rocks and uh, formations offshore um that point that george was talking about you can get it's one of the point or the the original point that we went out to that first day it's got a high Athena's point back. that's 60 feet high and catch comes out of like comes out of like 1200 feet of stuff. water yeah um but the, i think that first year george and i including a couple birds was around 65 yeah. 70 species yeah we've caught over over almost 80 species of fish since we've been down there yeah. on fly or just in general in general, in general yeah a lot yeah. of them were most most of them we've caught yeah, on yeah. Fly, but yeah yeah um but but that's sort of like has been the formula for us is we grew up fly fishing obviously but we also grew up spin fishing yeah still spin fish love spin fishing and um you know we've been able to put our heads together and use spin fishing as a tool to sort of launch the fly fishing game and kind of figure exactly. out what's going yeah, on figure out area. where the yeah. fish are figure out what part of the water columns they're at what they're eating if there are even fish there like if there are fish somewhere you're not if you can't get them to eat us eat an artificial on a spin rod or eat a bait on a spin rod right. like you're not going to be able to catch them on a fly yeah. so that was that was the formula there is you know we spent a lot of time Spin fishing. <laughs> yeah, a lot of, yeah, the inshore. And then, but we've got in, like a couple of the main species that we love to target are the yellowtail, um, yeah. which is like a rainbow runner for more. I'm trying to think of another it's a, species. It's an amberjack. So yeah. It's a yeah. yellowtailed yeah. amberjack. So it's like a more slender amberjack, member of the same family. Yeah. Um, wicked we, fish. I mean, they get big. We catch them anywhere between, you know, eight and 60 70 pounds i mean and, yeah. they, and they're, they're schooling fish and they're strong as hell um so yeah i mean but, yellowtail like and then the rooster as well is the other one that's always worth mentioning yeah um and we don't have a crazy population but when we do get the shots it's an absolute blast yeah, yeah. Um, and it's it's cool because when we first started going down there people didn't tell us we didn't people said there aren't rooster yeah, fish in they day and yeah. We don't really like to talk about the rooster fish in Mag Bay, but <laughs> yeah. there's a few around. But um, but anyway, I mean, no, the the inshore thing is like, like when I was mentioning earlier that we're in this constant state of sort of a perpetual exploratory scenario. Right. The inshore is really like, I mean, the offshore, you know what to expect, and like. Yeah. For the most part, you know what to expect, <laughs> but it's it's a crazy thing to expect. But still, like. You know, you go out there and you have these amazing days and 
Dorado, Pacific Sailfish, we've called short, short billed spearfish. Um, a guy who's actually in, that I fished with in the Bracho tournament this yeah. week caught one day, caught Dorado, yellowfin tuna, sailfish, marlin. Didn't land the marlin. We lost it right next to the boat, which was sad. But you didn't need to say yeah, that, yeah, but yeah, it's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm just making He's an sure. honest, an honest <laughs> angler here and rooster fish all in the same day. So that, it's like it, the offshore thing is crazy, and and you run into all these insane things: whales, orcas feeding on dolphins. I mean, like it's a nat. Ge- Every time a, you go out there, it's like you're turning down the nat geo channel. You never know what you're gonna see, but normally it's, it's gonna, gonna be, be at least some but the, one thing that will blow your mind but yeah exactly you have there's a there's at least a one day one thing mind blower 100 percent. that's a low slow coast guarantee but <laughs> but the inshore thing is much more of a puzzle yeah. yeah like we go out we're like all right let's go out find some birds we'll catch some marlin let's go yeah, yeah. inshore totally different ball game. Like, yeah what's the moon doing what's the tide doing where are they at at this stage of the tide where are they at, at that stage of the tide like the fish, like the yellowtail, these like, I mean, you, you call these inshore fish, but you know, we're fishing them around mouths. We're fishing them around structure. They feed on bait, certain t- moon phases. Yeah. We've sort of figured out that they like that quarter moon. They don't like that much moving tide. That's when they hang around like the areas that we can catch them mm-hmm. on light tackle, spin gear and fly. Um, and where they go when the tides are big, we don't know. I mean, offshore, like it's, it's really difficult to, uh, but it does seem like the nice thing about it is Mag Bay is sort of this hub where these fish, like yellowtail, like roosterfish, golden trevally, snook, you know, they end up coming into the bay, or yeah. they end up coming near the bay, and and we've been lucky enough to be crazy enough to put them out of time and to start to scratch the surface and figuring out the movements of those fish in respect to the tide and moon cycles and times of year, obviously. Yeah. Um, and, um, and it's been ridiculously fun. Yeah. 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 Like, like I was mentioning earlier, it's like putting that puzzle together and yeah. it's that puzzle is like, a, imagine a million piece puzzle and it, every day it's changing. That's a difficult one to crack, but it's been an absolute blast trying to. And yeah, it's been, yeah, at this point again, it's, we've got a pretty successful fishery. Um, and I we, think the coolest, I think I speak for both Rudy and I, like the, the coolest thing about that puzzle is like, we feel so fortunate, like to be able to do that in a place yeah. where nobody else is doing it. Right. Like this day and age, 2023, we're able to go hang out in a fishery and share it with people where there's no Intel We're, and there's no, there's no, Oh, freaking Johnny caught a fish at four thirty <laughs> on Instagram yesterday. And yeah. with the high rises in the background, I know he was in so and so key or whatever. And it's, it's, uh, it's unique. And to be able to share that with people is, it sounds cheesy, but it's really fun. I mean, it's like, it's wicked fun to be able to share it with, with folks who really appreciate it because because most of most of our guests and who are now become our friends and you know part of our Los Locos family are they really appreciate it and the intel that they have and what people bring to the table as Rudy said earlier in the podcast has been extremely valuable right massively um and in in I think you know the stimulation surrounding that and having our guests be a part of the exploratory process and be a part of our knowledge base in respect to the resource is like, is, is really cool. I mean, you can't say that everywhere. Yeah. You know? So, so that's like, yeah. And, and we, you know, back to the topic that we're talking about inshore fishing in Mag Bay. I mean, it's extremely difficult, overwhelming. There's so many options. The base is so big. It gets rough. You get tide versus winds, huge tidal swings, mangroves, you know, big channels, flats. I mean, and the problem is like, you can't really run a flat skiff in that bay because because you're in so much open water. That's so deep much open water. water. Yeah. Like I mean, huge tides. You could, nine if foot you tides. really pick your days, maybe you could. But like, and there are situations where 
it would be amazing to be able to pull a skit from that bit. Yeah. We did did that one time. We did that one time. Yeah. And (laughs) us almost sinking two skiffs that weren't ours. Yeah. But, um, (laughs) but, um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, and, and just the, the number of like targetable species inshore for the fly rod or light tackle spin. Yeah. Is a lot. And, and epic ones. I mean, golden trevally, snook, rooster fish, um, uh, you know, grouper, snapper. I mean, it, it, it goes forever. Yeah. 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 The golden trevally, when we first, the first golden trevally we ever caught, I also remember very well. We were like jigging this like 15 foot deep kind of flat to drop off. Little bit of like, I, I, I figured out what it looked like because we went spear fishing there. And it's like this little overhead, like it's like little sort of undercut depth change with like some very small crumbled rock structure, like subtle. Yeah. Covered in golden travel. And this was before I saw one spear fishing. Rudy's jigging. We're, we're, we're just kind of drifting, jigging. I think we had a depth sounder at that point. Didn't it probably we? didn't work. <laughs> uh, did, did, probably didn't work. Yeah. But we had, one. we had one. Yeah. But probably didn't work. You're right. Yeah. Um, and locks up to something like serious. And it's like, <laughs> And Rudy gets gunnelled by this thing in like twelve feet of water, and we're like, "Oh my god, it's got to be a big grouper!" Yeah. Um, and it was like you know twenty five pound golden trevally. And, and we, we like, didn't even know those things no lived way. over here. Like I remember we Australia. picked it up. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, wait, don't tell anybody uh, about this one. <laughs> what? Uh, <laughs> what? Yeah. Yeah. That Hit was some sort um, of wormhole and it ended up over in Australia. Other. Rudy yeah. dropped his jig through Mexico into Australia <laughs> and Those pulled out cenotes. a golden trevally. <laughs> Weird cenotes. Okay. Yeah, cenotes. Yeah, yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> um, but 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 shit like that, you know. Even the first rooster fish we saw in there, yeah, you know, couldn't believe it. We were like putting down the shoreline, and that was a huge. We one. see these two blow ups. Like, <laughs> it looks like bluefin tuna. Yeah. The and we're in short, we're like, can't be bluefin them. tuna. And we like speed up to it. It's happening so fast and it dispersed by the time we got up to it. But we were like, those were freaking giant rooster fish. Yeah. You know, 100 pounders. Dorsal yeah. fin. Yeah. Three feet yeah. out of yeah. air. And like, it's it's sailboat. Yeah. Yeah. Scary what, deal. What time of year are you guys down there? We're there you're from, not doing it year round, right? No. So we run um, our fall marlin season, which is sort of what people know us for right. um, yeah. is uh, October through January. And yeah. then um, we actually ran our first spring season last year, mm-hmm. um, spring, summer, whatever you want to call it, uh, May yeah. through the middle of July. Okay, uh, We're going to do that again this year. We're just keeping everything a little smaller. Trying to, you know, just keep everybody's expectations managed properly. And, um, yeah, we, we're psyched about the – really psyched about the spring season. The fall season is – you know, everybody knows what lights we do out. down there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Fall season's lights out, but spring season's really cool too. We do some really cool inshore specific stuff. Um and uh have some cool, unique opportunities. We catch a lot of Kubera snapper on fly rod, which is which is really That's cool. Sick. Yeah. yeah. Um a lot of yellowtail this year. We got white sea bass, yellowtail. Um we we figured some things out that we hadn't hadn't ever seen before, which was really fun and fun 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 for the guests to get to experience that because you know, that sort of client guide captain dynamic when you go out someday and something happens that's never happened before yeah which happens a lot in mac bay <laughs> is is exciting i mean that's electric shit that's freaking oh yeah that's great so uh so we yeah that was this was first this was the first time we caught white sea bass on the fly this summer right yeah yeah, yeah. What, we got a lot of them too what season are you guys going into like, uh, was it five uh like me and George, I think this will be our eighth year down there. Eighth year, okay. Yeah. Um, eighth but, year, like going down there and fishing, but it's sort yeah. of hard to like track, like because basically, like the evolution of this thing was us going down there having fun fishing yeah. first season, second season, hand obviously we told a bunch fun. of our friends, right? And but we were having fun, and our friends came down and helped pay for gas and stayed at the hotel and. All the locals were excited. Everybody was like, "Oh, new cool people to meet!" And, yeah. um, and and that was like, you know, our nickname. Everybody called us Gringos Locos. So that's like how that started. And then it's like more Gringos Locos kept coming down. And um, 
and it was just friends and friends and friends. And then, you know, after two or three years of doing stuff like that, everybody was like, why don't you guys start an actual business? And we're like, is that cool with everybody? We, we didn't want to step up. Step on any toes with that one, so we were a little nervous, but yeah, yeah. What, um, you guys, when you guys are running out for for the Marlin, um, well, I guess you and in, in, in the bay, like, what are you guys, what kind of boats are you guys using? So, one of the great things about what, what George and I have been trying to do, like we were just mentioning, we didn't want to step on the toes of the locals, but right. bring in business because we were nervous that they would think we're stealing their business. Yeah. Um, but once we... Which still happens a little bit. Yeah, a little, yeah. but... There yeah. Is, there's chirp in town about people who are like, you know, we're stealing people's business, but that's... It's it's a very few amount of people. Yeah. Like, initially, we thought, you know, we're going to get... Yeah, it, we, we were just nervous, but... Um, once, once we... Everyone started kind of... But if you bring people, that's good for the whole group right. of the whole town so once we right. got that idea it was like okay let's get this uh community involved as much as possible and we found the local panga builder and they built some incredible incredible boats but yeah we've been modifying these 28 foot pongas mm -hmm. for the last couple of years kind of critiquing out the platform sizes and where we want the gas tanks like, and yeah, all this and three years ago i think yeah three years ago was the or no four room. years ago no, three. Ranchero. Three, three. three Ranchero. Three years ago, we helped them design a mold. Yeah. Yeah. And these guys are actually like quite well known in the whole peninsula of Baja and all Great of Mexico pongas. for building really, really good commercial fishing pongas. Um, right. But they just, once, uh, there was one guy before us, and we loved this guy's boat. We saw it a couple of times driving around. He's actually one of our captains now. And... Uh, yeah, so we saw he built his super panga style um, with the gunnels as opposed to just having a thin little yeah. gunnel, but had a proper... Uh, like a proper, two, you know, 18-inch gunnel and... Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and after that, it was just... It kind of opened the doors like, wait, we've got these guys here who build incredible boats. They're right in our town. Let's, yeah. let's get them involved. And it's yeah. been awesome. It's been, that's honestly... It's been so fun, much fun, yeah. As some of the fishing is going in there, hanging out with the hanging boys out with those and talking and... fiberglass for a few hours, you know. <laughs> but it was amazing. I mean, like, showing them photos of, like, normal center consoles, showing them photos of flat skiffs. We were like, can let's figure out how to build a boat that's like an offshore skiff. Right. And yeah. and they did it. They nailed it the first time. I mean, they <laughs> smoked it. The, the When that first boat came out, we were like, no yeah. way this thing is sick yeah and I, I, uh, we were like trying to sleep in it even though we it did like sleep in, in it in front of us you know we got a bed in it right <laughs> oh god i'll sleep in the boat tonight yeah. <laughs> um but but it uh that's been so fun and i mean like rudy said we try to get everybody involved as much as possible like from our our dinner rotations. We have a lady that makes us lunch. We have another lady that makes us snacks. You know, we, we have this, it's in right. Like we're not trying to be like philanthropic about it or anything, yeah, but yeah. it's, it's fun. It's right. fun. Like the more people involved in our little team and, and just, you know, having, having that connection to that community is amazing. And it like, I, I don't think I've ever been anywhere, especially like fishing based where people are so welcoming and kind. Yeah. I mean, it's been like ridiculous. Like we didn't... The first day. So after that first amazing day that George and I and a couple other buddies had, we came back and we were just scratching our heads because we, we came back with fumes of gas. We were almost... Oh yeah, out. but literally we cramered it on yeah, the trailer. It was sure, yeah. amazing, like amazing performance. <laughs> yeah. But we get it on... Or the miracle it might be the proper yeah. terminology for yeah. that, yeah. But we, we were like, this is one example that was... The, really the opening day for us because it was the first real time we saw the and We got back. We were nervous about how do we get there and back consistently. And we get to the gas station. We meet up with one of our other good people or good friends and business associates, Gabino. And Gabino, he, she sees us. He's like, what are these gringos doing here? Like, came over, started He speaks English. This is the first guy we met in town like speaks English well. Yeah. yeah. Like, and that he, is also the cool thing about Puerto San Carlos. You go yeah. to a lot of places that are, you know, yeah, washed yeah. with English, Puerto San Carlos, no Pretty English. No English. <laughs> yeah, so he starts showing us these photos of these marlin that he's just starting to swim with, which has become a huge industry yeah, for them. Yeah, huge industry is the, 
swimming you know, eco-tourism swimming. swimming with Marlon. Yeah. It's mostly like it's cool. semi-professional slash very, uh, you know, people that are really into underwater photography and free diving. I guess, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Go on these offshore safaris and they have these incredible encounters with pelagic species Right. And they swim with the bait balls and photograph them and film them. And it, I mean, we encourage our clients to do it too. We were doing it before anybody else was doing it as well. I mean, yeah, there's a couple much other completely. groups right before. Yeah, but, but anyways, yeah, to bring back the, the Gabino, yeah. like the first day, we're sitting at this gas station scratching our head, like, okay, we're, I can we get gas tank anywhere. Everything's closed right now. Gabino rolls up. He's like, yeah, man, take this gas tank out of my car. I was like, what? we don't even know you, man. We're like, literally we're like, standing like, at the gas pump having a conversation of how are we going to get a gas can or something so we could take more gas so we go farther so we sail longer <laughs> blah 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 yeah. and this guy just rolls up and happenstantially gifts us a gas, a gas, a gas, gas can, can. A without gas knowing can. us or anything another five minutes go by and we're standing there still filling up his tank and this other guy comes by and this, and this guy's guy like, i think it's can. worth mentioning gabino has become our, like you know our, our best friend show. yeah our yeah. mexican business partner like he's our guy you met him arguably at people in town will say he's my father yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> striking resemblance it's uh it's it, hilarious yeah, that happens actually a lot in it. I've, I've been fooled a couple of times but yeah and we're so five minutes after we we're sitting there this guy rolls up another guy he kind of looks at us funny walks up to us and goes wait are you guys here fishing we were yeah. Like, yeah, we're here fishing. He's like, how you doing? We were talking about like the experience we had. He's like, yeah, yeah, that's pretty standard, but you don't have to run all that far. And he gave us a brand and new we're spot. we're like, what? And he gave us another <laughs> so spot. You and it's like, us out of the mouth. Yeah. And we're like, wait, in the last five minutes that we've been in this place, we had all of our issues resolved <laughs> through some just random, happy, nice people that saw these gringos that were struggling on the side. Of the and road. you're used to like being in fishing communities with people and everybody's like yeah. super tight-lipped and protective yeah. over there. Yeah personal information and it's like and he was Enrique was like this is Enrique Soto who's you know from a very cool fishing family fishing family his brothers we've worked his with dad, him his brothers his, his dad, dad was actually the first person to take fly fishing anybody fly fishing in, in yeah. Bay. he was Gary Graham's guide who wrote Baja on the Fly I'm not sure if you've heard of that book but um Gary Graham wrote Baja on the fly or Magdalena Bay on the fly. No, I don't know. But but yeah, he he was down there doing in you the, know, in the nineties, yeah. in the early two thousands, late nineties, early two thousands, I believe. Um did a lot of fly fishing stuff in Mag Bay and yeah. caught a bunch of big snook and all kinds of cool stuff and, and and Enrique's dad, Enrique Senior was was his guide and you know, sort of passed that down to Enrique and his other sons and yeah, Jose Alberto and Josue, and we work with all those guys, and and they're the most stoked dudes ever. I mean, like, that, all of our captains, it's like the fly fishing thing. Yeah. People are like, that's crazy. And if it, that works, that's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. why is even that? Yeah. But, yeah, the, the, the generosity, the... There's really no words to describe how positive this community yeah. can be and how how helpful they are. Um, and honestly, with we would never ever ever be able to, to do nearly what we do no. without the help. Right now, Gabino is working on our boats. He's getting trailers made. He's yeah. we got our guys putting in fresh hot water tank or heaters in our hotel. We got like constantly people working down there around the clock and. Yeah, it's just out of their own generosity and obviously but it's been cool well. to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's been cool it's, to be able to stimulate that, that place yeah. yeah and and to be able to see um you know we're working on a film right now with grant Wiswell and andy daniel chuck and you know tom enderlin and a handful of other people um it's just cool to see the positive impact that sport fishing fly fishing, you know, whatever you want to look at it as tourism has on a place. For the whole community. Yeah, yeah. and it, yeah. because we, we walk this fine line and you're like, you're like, okay, this is a zone that is really special to us. This is something that we need to protect. We need to, we want to keep it secret, like blah, 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 blah. And you walk this fine line by like trying to keep it on the DL, but at the same time, you need to run your business. We want need to run our business and 
our people need us to run our business. Yeah. Yeah. And the fact that we started a spring season this year was huge yeah. For, yeah. for us, obviously, but hotels for the, the guys, hotels, the for cafes. the guides, the town is a ghost town when we're not around and not to uh, toot geez. our own horns. I'm just saying it's, you know, the, the diving thing is big, but it's fleeting. It's usually lasts seriously for like almost only a month. Yeah. And then there's whale season, but it, you know, it's it, to be able to, to bring folks to San Carlos and stimulate that economy has been amazing. And, and to be able to do it now during two seasons has been really great for our captains and their families and, and, you know, the owner of the hotel and, and everybody. I mean, yeah. it's, um, it's, it's, it's really sweet. And, and like Rudy said, you know, we have people constantly, we're constantly trying to, step our game up a little bit and the cool thing is we have really cool guests that um are honest with us about their experiences and we can you know build and evolve from there and 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 being able to build the boats down there is amazing i mean it's to, to me i think and i would say broody agree as well like the the wherewithal and the adaptability of the folks in san carlos is insane I mean, yeah. like we get everything we need to get done in San Carlos. And That's when awesome. we first went down there, we didn't think that would be the case. We were like, yeah. we need to bring a big, nice center console down here. Yeah. We need to bring all of our equipment down here. We need to bring nice trailers down here. Yeah. We need to bring this and that and this. And then we sl- we shifted, I was going to say slowly, but no, it was aggressive. quickly. Yeah, it was. We shifted to the we're doing people everything here, here in San Carlos know how to build boats that run this bay right they know how to build trailers that trailer those boats they know how to fix up like we do everything in san carlos we build our trailers right in san carlos we have a welder that builds our trailers in san carlos he builds a sick barbecues and he builds his trailers. <laughs> they are badass barbecues <laughs> and, and they're they're bomb proof and if they break or anything happens to them you take we take the trailers right back to teco and he said, and he like apologizes to you <laughs> profusely, and then fixes them. And and it's free of charge. And the same thing with the boats. Like something happens to the boat, they're like so upset and angry. Yeah. And then they fix it, and it's like blah blah blah, won't happen again. But it's not like, you know, there's a pride, there's a sense of pride in the craftsmanship, for right. The specificities yeah. that exist in that place because it's really unique, and everything that. The folks are doing there is like to us was foreign initially we we're like that's not gonna work <laughs> they were like that's 220 pound mono you just rigged up as your trim tabs <laughs> sure enough it works it works <laughs> yeah if you rig mono from the middle of your cockpit straight back to where your transom's at it depending on how loose the mono is or sometimes they use like paracord yeah right? paracord uh it works it works like trim taps. It's yeah. like unbelievable. That's ridiculous. Yeah, if you tighten them up, it'll drop the bow down. If you loosen them up, it'll pick the bow up. Dude, yeah, it's I want to see that. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, it makes. Like I mean, trim tabs. I say that makes sense, but like, I mean, those guys have been commercial fishing there forever. A lot of ingenuity there. A lot yeah. of ingenuity, those and and, and they know how to get it done. Know yeah. how to get it done, and and seeing what our captains know and how they learned it. And the, the spatial awareness on the water in respect to landmarks, yeah, being able to navigate without a GPS, oh knowing goodness. where they're at, is incredible. Yeah. How, pe- like you know, hearing stories of how they did it, how they learned it without GPS, without a sounder, you know, in respect to where this mountain is, where this tree yeah. is, how many seconds if you're running at however many RPMs with what like. Oh yeah. I mean, like counting in their heads to see distances, to see a rock pile, and I mean stuff that is incredibly impressive. And you like felt like in your life you were just gonna read about that kind of stuff, you know? Yeah. And then being able to meet people and actually guys. learn that way, and I mean, it's it's really humbling. Yeah. What um, I think we got time for like one more. What do you guys like? You you guys were talking about when you first got down there, and you first went out there on the on the Boston Whaler, you broke all your rods, 
before, oh yeah all the reels rods are so what are you guys using well like, is it custom stuff or we use it's the gear it's 12 weights it's 12 weights hardies um and yeah, we use the fortuna and the marksman z yeah and um, this the big thing that we've realized is of the so the the marlin they eat they take off and it's chaos yeah once that chaos stops they start sounding and once they start sounding you can either try to break them with your rod but yeah. that will never happen or you just maneuver the boat around in the first years what we were doing was using the rod and now, after a few years, we started moving away from just trying to lift them to getting away from the fish, bringing the fish up, chasing the fish down when they're like that, as opposed to just constantly just breaking gear. And yeah. now we, granted, with the chaos that goes on when you're doubled up on Marlin and you got your captain so excited, he's trying to throw a fly in there as well, <laughs> rods are going to blow. You know, right. Th th that does happen. But um, what the gear... It's been, it's, we're going easier on it now. I think now that we're slowly getting it slightly figured out. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's the gear, it's, it's your standard gear. And then we use 500 grain sinking lines a good bit. I've fell in love with fishing just poppers at the end of the year this year. So a lot of floating lines yeah. too. Um, but yeah, big hooks, uh, on all the flies. Um, if people want a fish class, they can, um, it's not mandatory for us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, but with that being said, anywhere from 60 to 120, depending on how aggressive they are that day and how many fish you want to break off or how many you want to try to land. What's um, like yeah. an average day? There is no such thing as average. Fair enough. Um, but when we're we have days day, where we catch over 20 fish. Yeah, but tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. Right, not not in one boat. Not in one boat. But, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but our like fleet on, will catch. But, but the, yeah. A no. good day, in my opinion, is get one or two per person. That's the ideal. Yeah. Like once you start getting three, four, I've had one guy land nine, and is he, that Jimmy Clute? Yeah, yeah. Or I thought he did twelve. No, Jimmy got nine. Jimmy got nine. Jimmy no, got nine. Yeah, but it, it shout was, out to Jimmy Clute. Yeah, Jimmy's <laughs> yeah. a sick beauty. Yeah, he is. Um, but he like like you almost you forget about him. Like it's like yeah. it becomes almost like a numbers thing. Yeah, yeah. But like just, if one or two, that's a res you respect it still. It's a beautiful thing, and it's. You watch the thing go away. You don't do too much impact on the bait balls and let them do their thing, and you get. And there's that also growth. so much to experience. Yeah, well, like it's just not about all the marlin. It's there. Not, there's right. a lot you know, more dynamic fishery than just. We're not huge on the numbers game. I mean, yeah, like we just, you know, we've talked about like putting a cap on how many fish you can catch. Like some days you can go. Just out to leave them alone. Some, still leave them alone, and also just like. It's special. Like it shouldn't be like yeah. I want to get easy. double digit marlin. Like oh yeah yeah yeah. yeah go catch you. a marlin on the fly from a drifting boat without the use of baiter teasers. Like it's fun. Yeah. Like it's, catch one. It's cool. Yeah. And, get, uh, get a few. I mean, but but the gear it, is and if the they want to get ten, you know, figuring we'll try. out the gear. Rudy's been spearheaded that over the past you know eight nine years and. You know, it's it's taking a little, it's it's we're oh, still in the, and we're still in the process of yeah. figuring out what yeah. what the best moves are to make. Um, yeah. We work really closely with Hardy and you know what what they're doing. We really believe in and you know and a lot of it comes down to the reel too. Yeah, you know that reel's got to hold up. Yeah, because that yeah. thing is gonna. It's not like trout fishing skinny. where the reels just hold line. No, 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 no. <laughs> That it, real, if anything, it's the reverse. The rod, yeah. you, you like it, the rod the is best, useless. The, 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 best, the real, the real is all you got. The people that bite these fish best, they do not put a bend in the rod. No. They point that thing straight at them and use the reel. It's like a tug of war. Yeah. And that, that, like you watch those guys fight fish. That's how you bring them in in under five minutes and consistently. That's, besides the reel, the most important ge like gear that we use is our team. Yeah, I yeah. mean we haven't like. Man, this podcast has flown by, but we haven't been able to talk about like the people that we have surrounding us. We've talked about our captains a lot, but you know, our formula is we run a fly fishing specific guide, guide slash deckhand on the boat. Yeah, and um, you know, a local San Carlos captain mm -hmm. who runs the boat, and you know, our our team's amazing. Um, Noah Thompson, Cam Chaffee, Alec Lucas, Christian, Christian. Pretorius. Um, those those are kind of our staple guys, Rudy and I. And then, um, you know, we have got Wesley Locke yeah. is running all of our logistics, and you know she's from has an amazing fly fishing 
family and resume and you know is is really organized and we we need that pretty seriously as well yeah but um but we've been but very fortunate we've to find an amazing fishery. amazing the finding the fisheries but but what, having yeah, the team having surround the team us and having the people to experience it yeah. with yeah. and and also the wealth of knowledge i mean noah cam alec like Noah and cam those guys are like insane anglers insane christian pretorius Guy's an insane angler. Like he's a wicked, <laughs> he's a wicked good angler. And yeah, and incredible. Benny Blanco, uh, Brandon Brandon Sear. Sear, they're coming down for two three weeks to help us guide this this October or uh, awesome. no, this December when we're getting when we get super busy and and just the support that we've had from the community when sharing it with people has been to me, I think. That's you the know, most special. It's just it just makes it feel like possible. Yeah, you know, they're like, you guys are doing good. Keep doing it, <laughs> and we're like, okay, okay, we're gonna, okay. Get, we're gonna keep doing it. Yeah. <laughs> what uh, um, if somebody wants to come down and hang out with you guys? Like, what's the best way? Like, how to like how would someone find you? So we have a website. Um, our email is loslocosmagbay at gmail dot com. Okay. Um, Wesley is uh, you know doing all of our logistics and booking. Um, but you know, feel free to reach out to us on Instagram and, or, or email or, or whatever. And, you know, we love, love sharing this place with people and, yeah. and, and it's, um, it's really cool for our guides. It's really cool for our captains. And it's been, it's been a crazy journey for us. Just, you know, the support that, that everybody's been giving us and yeah. we're super stoked. I mean, yeah, yeah it's. No, the first time that Noah told me about it, just listening to him talk, like not even yeah. like the words he was saying, just and the way, just, like the, the foam like, that the was way. building up in the corners of his mouth. Yeah, we, yeah <laughs> I yeah. was like, dude, this has got to be something. This is beyond. Like yeah. before I ever saw photos, I talked to Noah about it. And I was like, just like, yeah, listening to him talk. I'm like, dude, this is something special. The best yeah. thing in the world is making a full grown man sound like a little girl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Watching him no, no, squeal on the front of the boat with a yeah. smile from cheek to cheek or yeah. ear to ear is one of the most satisfying things ever. But also, I think it's also worth continuing to mention Noah. Yeah. Because Noah has been Crucial. huge to us. Yeah. Like, huge. I mean, stuff. Just, just adding another level of intensity and passion to like what Rudy and I already had mm -hmm. to have somebody else come in and reignite that yeah. when we met Noah fresh legs fresh legs I mean it Noah yeah we we freaking love that kid oh yeah, yeah. he's one of the best people and um and, and and our whole grad crew is amazing but Noah's Noah's really you know I think puts more gas in our tank you know because it's not easy and it's sometimes frustrating and tiresome and you're like yeah, sometimes oh, do yeah you yeah. really want to keep doing this yeah. like, what are we sometimes it's like you sometimes it's work a little bit <laughs> yeah, yeah it's work a, a lot of it <laughs> <laughs> well guys i appreciate you guys taking the time to sit down with me and talk about it a little bit um you guys have seen my truck eventually it's going to that truck's coming down Baja. Please, that man. thing looks yeah. like a Baja yeah. rig, bro. <laughs> um, and then if next time you guys are in Texas, hopefully I can get you on the skiff. Cool. And we'll go pull around a little bit. That'd be a pleasure, man. Yeah. That'd be a pleasure. Um, thank you for having yeah, us on. Yeah, we really definitely. appreciate it. Yeah. If you guys, um, if you're watching on YouTube, hit like, hit subscribe, all that stuff. Check out, I'm going to leave links down below so that they can check out Los Locos. If you're listening on Spotify, that's the thing. That's the thing. Leave a five-star review for me. And uh, I think we have one minute until we get kicked out of the Airbnb. So we we'll time this perfectly. <laughs> we nailed it. Yeah. Nailed In the it. slot. <laughs> All right, see you guys. Thanks, Pete. Thank you.